make you think about your own uh, teaching practices, right? So um, let me check that uh, you can all hear me and see the uh, presentation without any blocking of whatever sort. Yes, all right, thank you so much for confirming that. So we're going to start with the first part of this talk. As I said, we're going to talk about interculturality, um, which is a very fashionable term nowadays. Many people talk about interculturality uh, from different perspectives. And the linguistic perspective is uh, just one of them. Of course, interculturality has to do with interaction uh, with other human beings, of course. Uh, but, uh, and, and in that sense, you know, the linguistic aspect of interculturality is perhaps uh, very relevant. And it's going to be relevant regardless of the, um, you know, approach that you take to interculturality. Now, another thing that I want to mention before we start talking about interculturality is the fact that uh, for many people, what um, they understand as interculturality is in fact cross-culturality, and it's not the same. Mm -hmm. There is a very basic difference between cross-cultural communication studies and intercultural communication studies. Now, cross-cultural communication studies are perhaps uh, an older perspective of intercultur interculturality. Um, very famous, let's say, in the 70s and 80s, uh, especially in the business area, mm -hmm. um, with business people interacting uh, with other people from different countries, right? So the, the, the limits and the boundaries between one culture and the other one were very clear and basically based on nationalities rather than other aspects of uh, cultural identity as we're going to see uh, today. So we're going to establish, or we're going to start by establishing the differences between cross-cultural communication and intercultural communication and how studies, how scholars have approached these two different areas of, um, you know, culture. Mm -hmm. First of all, the study of communicative practices, so the way we interact with language with others, uh, is uh, or relates from the cross-cultural communication perspective to distinct cultural groups independent from interaction. Yeah. So interaction is very important here. Uh, and uh, from the point of view of cross-cultural communication, interaction is really, uh, you know, not observed or not perhaps considered in the way we define things. But on the other hand, from the point of view of intercultural communication, the study of communicative practices, so the way we speak, the way we talk, our conversations, emails with other people, of a distinct cultural groups or other groups in interaction is very, very important. So in other words, when people study cross-cultural communication, they do not care so much perhaps about how the actual conversation or the actual communication, whereas intercultural communication pays attention to that and any definition, any conclusion that is going to be drawn about cultural identities or communication, for example, is going to, uh, you know, stand from the interaction itself in this case and in this sense um, you know conversation analysis is very important in terms of intercultural communication now another basic difference is that cross-cultural communication studies view culture as separable entities mm -hmm. so um, being Chilean is one thing and it's very, very different from being Argentinian, for example, or Peruvian or whatever nationality you're thinking about. Being a Christian is very different from, uh, for example, being a Buddhist or mm -hmm, whatever religion you follow, right? Now, whereas uh, intercultural communication sees cultures as not bounded entities with national borders, Instead, identity and cultural identity is dynamic and their boundaries are blurred, mm -hmm. so they're not clear, yeah? Uh, in that sense, for example, <clears throat> if you are looking at your identity, your national identity from a cross-cultural perspective, perhaps you're going to emphasize the differences between the nationalities that I mentioned as an example before. Whereas if you are looking at your identity and cultural identity from an intercultural communication perspective or intercultural perspective, you're not going to emphasize the differences very much. Mm -hmm. 
So, <clears throat> very good. Another difference is cultures are viewed as relatively homogeneous according to the cross-cultural communication perspective. In this sense, you know, people who belong to any given culture, for example, a national one, are going to be expected to behave in a certain way, a way that is very similar, of course. Mm -hmm. So you're going to expect these people from a different, for, from a particular group to behave in a certain way, to have uh, the same values, for example, uh, to you know, uh, use language. Mm -hmm, talking about linguistic, uh, linguistic uh, aspects in a very similar way. Yeah. Whereas on the other hand, intercultural communication views cultures as heterogeneous, so that's mixed, varied, diverse, containing a great deal of variety amongst its members. Right. From this point of view, from interculturality, in that sense, for example, Chileans are not the same. And I think that, you know, even if you don't know much about intercultural communication from the linguistic uh, point of view, you're going to, um, you know, already believe this. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, you know, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, um, at a thinking level, so to speak, people uh, say that all Chileans are the same, right? Perhaps we behave in a way that, uh, you know, um, uh, makes us um, um, conceive all Chileans as the same, but at least we don't verbalize. Yeah? Now, another difference between these two perspectives is that cultures are viewed as a national level from the cross-cultural communication point of view, but from an intercultural communication studies point of view or perspective, national cultures are one of the many discourse communities. Mm -hmm. Discourse communities defining the interaction that these you know, groups have. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's very, um, you know, um, very complex nowadays, given that uh, you know, uh, we don't have to leave the national borders nowadays to communicate with other people. We can communicate online. We're going to do an exercise in which you're going to see that Right. So other aspects of culture or cultural identity include gender, generation, for example, difference, uh, differences between ages, professions, ethnicity and others as well. So nationality is very important for cross-cultural communication studies. And this is, you know, the way people who do cross-cultural studies um, you know, approach uh, identities. But from an intercultural communication perspective, nationality is just one aspect of your cultural identity, and there can be many. In that sense, of course, there's going to be more heterogeneity. Now, I priori assumption about cultural grouping. So uh, cultural groupings, in other words, is a cultural identity. Mm -hmm. So a cross-cultural perspective is going to see uh, cultures or groups as uh, you know, as something that is predetermined. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if you talk about religion in this case, if you think about Catholics, uh, you're going to believe that all Catholics behave the same way and have the same values, as I said before, uh -huh, without getting to know and study them. Yeah. Whereas intercultural communication uh, does not have any prior assumptions about, you know, how these people behave and how they use language to interact with members of that same community. Mm -hmm. And I think that the last perspective is that, you know, cross-cultural communication studies um, study communication and identity with experiments and quantitative research, whereas intercultural communication studies um, for, or for intercultural communication studies, qualitative research is uh, better. Mm -hmm. It's a better choice for that because it allows you to look at interaction and the changes in identity and your protection of identity in a deeper way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But that's not important for this one, right? It's just, you know, to mention or to round up how these two different approaches to studies or cultural studies have uh, conceived um, you know, um, um, research in this way. So before we get into more definitions and more theory, perhaps, um, we're going to do a little exercise. So I would like you to go to this website that you see here. You have the QR code, uh, code in case you are using your phone, for example. I would prefer to do it like that. And uh, once you do that, 
you're going to see a question, which is the same one that you see here. So I would like you to define perhaps in a couple of words or in a whole sentence, that's really up to you, what intercultural competence is for you. Mm -hmm. So we're moving from the area of intercultural communication over interculturality in general to intercultural competence. So in other words, what does a person with a high level of intercultural competence do, for example? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a few minutes, a couple of minutes, actually, not that much. Um, let me see if I can share this. All right. Has anybody tried writing? Just want to know whether these words are not. I haven't used it for a while. Okay, right, let me see. I think it's this one. How about now? So here's the link to the question. You can see it in the chat. Okay, so um, beautiful, thank you so much. Fantastic. So that's uh, more or less, you are all on the right track. Uh -huh. um, um, the, 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 the words that I like perhaps the most, not because you know they are correct uh -huh, as opposed to the other ones are adaptability. Right. Uh, why do I like that word? Uh, it's because, you know, uh, we always talk about being adaptable, but that's one of the things or one of the areas that it's easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Once you are interacting or, you know, uh, in front of a difficult situation uh, that arises from intercultural differences, uh, you know, uh, it's not so easy sometimes to be um, adaptable. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a real problem. So different mm -hmm, ability, interact. That's another key word in the uh, concept of intercultural concept. Knowledge, very good. Uh -huh. We're going to discuss that as well very briefly when we talk about the definition. Um, what does knowledge mean in this case? Yes. Um, participate, identity. That's a very crucial concept when we talk about culture mm -hmm, and interculturality. Very very good. Non-stereotypes, very good. That's, you know, what we were discussing before uh, with respect to the preconceptions that you have about certain groups. Mm -hmm. Very good. Excellent. Okay, I could go on the whole morning or the rest of the afternoon, actually, talking about all the concepts that you have uh, included here. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in honor of time, and for the sake of time, we're going to go to the uh, definitions, uh -huh. the, uh, um, you know, perhaps more a very operational definition. Yes, it's, it's, it does not stem from research. This is a definition. The one that you're about to see uh, is a definition. Sorry, by the way, can you see my screen again? It appears that every time I change screens, I stop sharing. How about now? Super, thank you so much, Astrid Paolo, very good. Um, you know, I haven't used Zoom for a while, so uh, I kind of forgot how to do things here. So the definition that you're going to see now is from um, the um, UNESCO people, basically, uh, the people who are very much concerned with interculturality. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Basically, having intercultural competence or having a very high degree of intercultural competence relates to having an adequate, relevant knowledge about particular cultures. That's very important because even if we have traveled the world or, you know, talked to many different people who are not similar to us, you know, um, your, your knowledge about different cultures cannot be that extensive. So you're not going to be able to know and interact with all the different cultures around the world, be that national cultures, uh, you know, institutional cultures, political cultures, whatever, whatever cultural identity you're approaching here. Mm -hmm. So um, relevant knowledge about particular cultures. Of course, these particular cultures are going to vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. The cultures that I interact with are not going to be the same cultures that my neighbor um, is used to interacting. Yeah? So um, that depends on the person. Yeah? So apart from this knowledge about particular cultures, you have a general knowledge about the sorts of issues arising when members of different cultures interact. Mm -hmm. So that's also very important as well. And that helps you if you have this general knowledge about the possible problematic areas, uh, perhaps you're going to, um, you know, um, approach uh, any interaction with a person whose culture you're not very much acquainted to uh, with a more uh, respectful, uh, respectful and sensitive way. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, um, you know, that's what you have to have. Mm -hmm. In other words, knowledge and, um, you know, um, awareness of the possible problematic or controversial areas are important here. Mm -hmm. An example of a controversial point is, uh, you know, um, the way different people appro approach marriage and sex, for example, yes, or uh, money. Mm -hmm. uh, these type of things, they tend to be very problematic in uh, different cultures as well. Also, having a high level of intercultural competence means holding receptive attitudes towards diverse others. Mm -hmm. So receptive attitudes uh, means that you have a very open mind uh, or open minded approach to, uh, you know, accepting differences as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, having the skills to draw upon knowledge and attitudes, the ones that we discussed in the first point, when interacting with others. Yeah. So you do not only have this knowledge, but you're also able to retreat this knowledge when you are interacting with people whose uh, you know, culture is different from yours. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is very theoretical, perhaps very abstract. 
Uh -huh. And um, uh, when you when you see people with a high a level of intercultural uh, competence interacting in different situations, you have to be aware that they might be successful in certain interactions, but that success might be absolutely absent in other types of interactions. Right. In other words, if you are interculturally competent, it doesn't mean that you're not going to offend anybody or that you're not going to raise any uh, controversial problematic topics in any given conversation. You see, so this is I mean. Uh, it takes two to tango, right? You know that expression. And, and this is, you know, what happens with communication as well, with any given interaction, be that oral or written. Uh -huh. um, you know, uh, you might have the competence uh, to negotiate your um, interaction and, 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 and the knowledge that you and the information that you are sharing in any given conversation, for example, uh, but it also depends on the other part, on the other interlocutor, of course. Mm -hmm. So that is a very broad definition uh, of intercultural competence. And, uh, you know, before I move on, I just wanted to say that uh, these skills and this knowledge is not only knowledge about how to speak or how to use the language in general, but also knowledge about values, about attitudes, uh, about many other aspects of human interaction, right? But of course, uh, this talk is going to highlight the language aspect of this intercultural competence. So, uh, when we talk about uh, identities and when we talk about culture, mm -hmm, we uh, have different constituents of identities, right? In other words, our cultural identities are not composed by just one aspect. There are many, many aspects of, um, of, of uh, constituent or, or of our identities, right? And uh, Ru Gan Lu, mm -hmm, a Chinese um, 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 researcher, uh, in the field of culture and also language and linguistics, devised this model um, uh, on identity. And, and, and I, I like this because he uses the initials to uh, you know, define and introduce the different aspects of your personality, the initials of the word identity, so the, the letters of the word identity, sorry. So uh, first of all, we have I, inspirational, and within inspirational, right, things that divide, define this type of, 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 um, you know, uh, of this constituent of our identity are religious beliefs, moralities, aesthetics, ideologies, et cetera, et cetera. So anything that goes from your religion religious aspect or your religious persona to the political one as well, right? So we have the deictic ones, the D, mm -hmm, I, me, mine, we, you, he, self, etc., etc. So let us take the pronoun, the subject pronoun, we, yeah? Uh, that is going to be, for example, um, um, reinterpreted or has to be reinterpreted interpret it according to uh, who is uh, holding the turn, for example, in any given interaction. So the word we can represent we students, mm -hmm, or in this case, we teachers, teachers of English. But in another completely different situation, we can refer to, for example, a whole nation when the president is, you know, addressing a, a whole country, and he or she says we, uh -huh. That we is going to be different, of course. Mm -hmm. Same happens with the other pronouns, of course. So that's why we talk about the ictic, the ictic um, you know, uh, notions of, um, you know, um, identities. Mm -hmm. The ethnic one perhaps is the most apparent one, mm -hmm. um, black, Chinese, white, etc., etc. So uh, your ethnicity, mm -hmm. the way you look perhaps is going to influence that aspect of your uh, cultural identity. National as well, that is also very, very uh, you know, um, in the foreground mm -hmm. because of what I explained before, cross-cultural studies which uh, perhaps is the origin of intercultural studies, uh, viewed nations as the main paradigm for the study of these differences and the interaction. 
Then we have the temporal one. So we tend to forget about these ones as well. Mm -hmm. And that says age is uh, perhaps one of the most apparent ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a different identity when you're old than uh, the identity you had when you were young or younger. Mm -hmm. uh, that depends on you. Of course, more people have, um, you know, or um, perhaps they feel more comfortable with that type of change than other you know, people. Uh -huh. um, so that's going to uh, influence, of course, your identity as well. Uh, in other words, your identity 10 years ago, it doesn't have to be the same identity that you have now. Mm -hmm. Inherited as well, gender, race, ancestry, uh, et cetera, et cetera, DNA. Uh -huh. If you've seen this, uh, there's plenty of them in, in Netflix. There's documentaries about twins, for example. You will see that the way certain people behave is determined by their DNA information. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's very nice as well, right? Oh, it can be a little bit daunting too. Uh, territorializing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the West, the East, the, East, the Middle East, uh, non-Western, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, of course, uh -huh. Re, um, you know, regardless of the nationality, the place where you live is going to influence uh, how you are mm -hmm. and uh, the constituents of your identity. Institutional as well, and this is very closely linked to the temporal aspect. Yeah, your institutional. Um, identity it doesn't have to be the same all the time, especially nowadays that, for example, people change jobs every so often, right? If you look at our grandparents' generations or our parents' generations, you're going to see that they stuck to one job, uh, basically their whole professional life. Uh, but nowadays that doesn't happen. So this institutional um, identity is not uh, perhaps as permanent as it was uh, once before. So in that sense, for example, uh, we can define ourselves in this group, in this particular interaction as uh, teachers of English, right? Uh, which has to do, of course, with the institutional aspects. We're all assigned to different uh, schools, different universities, institutes, et cetera, et cetera, all right? Mm -hmm. People who work for the government have, they usually have a very strong institutional identity, yeah? Uh, of course, that's not true all the time. Economic, yeah, that's also part of your identity. You are defined as rich, as wealthy, as poor, middle class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And finally, social, yes, that has to do also with economic, um, you know, um, identities or aspects of your identity as well. In that sense, you can be middle class, low class, uh, you know, uh, employer, employee, upper class, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. Now, I was uh, using the same um, 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 chart with uh, my language and culture students um, this semester, and one of them pointed out that there is a very important aspect of identity that is missing from this chart. Can anybody see that missing part as well? Gender, yes. Mm -hmm. Language, yes, very good. Language is as well perhaps something that's going to be missing here. Although we could say that language is part of the national identity, although you know the one-to-one -one relationship is not always clear, right? Um, education as well, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's also very much linked to perhaps the social and the economic aspects of your identity as well. Anyway, the one that my student pointed out as missing was a sexual identity, right? And we were trying for a while to place sexual identity in any of these categories. And it was, you know, sort of hard uh -huh, because, you know, your sexual orientation, for example, your sexual identity um, might be inherited or not, you know, Mm -hmm. There's still, you know, some debate going on there. It could be social as well. It could be inspirational too. So uh, it's difficult to define. Yes. And I think that, you know, not only for this aspect, sexual orientation, but other aspects of identity and other constituents of identity, we cannot see this as, you know, individual boxes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these aspects of, of identity overlap and, um, you know, uh, it's difficult to tell them apart. Yeah. 
So why am I showing you this? Is because you know when people talk about intercultural communication, they tend to think, uh -huh, and I've, I've seen this in many communications, and I've seen this even uh, when you hear the news and television talking. Um, you know when when politicians are talking on the te in the television, um, people tend to view uh, intercultural communication as still based on national boundaries right or ethnic boundaries and this is very much in vogue nowadays uh when the new proposal for the constitution uh -huh, when we have this pluralistic or plurinational you know um state uh -huh. um so people talk about ethnicity and intercultural communication in that sense which is correct of course it's one of the aspects of intercultural competence and intercultural communication but it's not the only one Right. So when we say that nowadays we have uh, intercultural classrooms uh -huh, because we have people from or students from Venezuela, from Republica Dominicana, from Colombia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, of course, it's true, right? But you have to consider that in the same classroom, even if you have uh, students from one nationality only with one native language, there are going to be a lot of cultures in that in that, uh, in that group, uh -huh. and, and 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 the students are going to uh, you know perhaps associate and group in different ways according to those cultures. I'm going to show you an example now to see how that uh, you know is realized. Mm -hmm. This is um, not a real example. Yeah, there is a text here. I'm going to give you time to read that. Mm -hmm. I hope it's big enough. And uh, based on what we saw before in the previous slide, I would like you to consider which constituents are part of this description. This is a description about a student, a woman, um, who has different aspects of identity. So I'm going to remain silent for a couple of minutes for you to read this and uh, tell me which constituents of identity you can see.
Good. Just to say that I've written something in the chat. Um, um, just, you know, an invitation for you to write your answers as, as you read. Yeah? We're going to give it another minute and then we're going to share your answers. Okay, mm -hmm. shall we uh, move on? Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, I've seen some of the points that you are uh, writing uh, and uh, highlighting, and, and I agree mm -hmm. most most of them. Um, it's um, it's very difficult to perhaps classify some of them. So what I've done here is just to uh, highlight those parts of the narration in which you can see uh, any different constituent according to the ones we saw before. And perhaps together we can define whether that's, you know, a national, ethnic, institutional, temporal, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, we have a university student. That to me is institutional, of course, but is also temporal. Mm -hmm. Um, nowadays, people um, stay in university longer than perhaps um, 20 or 30 years ago, but still, uh, you know, your university, your identity as a university student of, is, of course, you know, not permanent. Mm -hmm. You cannot be a university student all the time mm -hmm, or your life. It's, it's very expensive as well, right? So uh, that's, you know, um, one of the um, aspects of identity that we can see here, institutional, temporal as well. Now, another a similar one is English for professional communication. That's also perhaps institutional and perhaps social, because when you have a profession, uh, that defines you as well in society. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can see that very clearly in different countries where, for example, teachers are better regarded in certain societies than others. I'm afraid to say that in this country, teachers are not very highly regarded. Yeah. Uh, but in other countries like Japan, for example, um, you know, that situation changes a little bit. Yeah. And so it has to do with social identity as well. Now, Facebook, why am I highlighting Facebook here? Why do you think I'm doing that? It's temporal, yes, very good, mm -hmm. right? And what do you do when you go on Facebook? Well, or Instagram nowadays, and you know, people say that uh, Facebook is now for old people. You can change your identities, absolutely. You can project a different identity if you want to. And that gives sometimes a way to certain crimes. Uh -huh. 
uh, which is totally undesirable, of course. Yeah, and exactly, Karina, very good. You can talk to people from different places and, culture, and cultures. This is something that we were not able to do before with so much ease, with so much, you know, um, um, you know speed. Mm -hmm. uh, before, perhaps 20, 30 years ago, we could communicate with people via email or letters, you know, handwritten letters. Uh, but, uh, you know, nowadays it's faster, it's most instantaneous. So that allows, you know, for uh, more fluid interaction. Yeah. Now, when you interact on Facebook, you can find groups, you see. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, Homan, this lady has found a group which has to do with, uh, sorry, we're going to go back to her grandmother in a minute, uh -huh. uh, with Japanese anime, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Although Japanese anime and the chat and the group that they have, uh, especially with her friend Stephen, is not necessarily done via Facebook, perhaps, you know, is, is one of the ways in which you can do that, yeah? And so uh, when we talk about Facebook, uh, perhaps it's not an aspect of or a constituent of an identity as such, but it's a platform whereby we can find and group uh, with uh, people who are similar to us, right? Very good. Yes, Trace. Anime is certainly a very, very strong type of identity. The people who like anime, who are anime fans, have a very, very strong identity. And, uh, you know, in the sense that they portray that in the way they dress, in the way perhaps they use language, and also in the way they, you know, group as well. Mm -hmm. So that's very good. So uh, let's go back a little bit. Yes, in, in this case, we have her grandmother. That's also part of your identity. Yes, which part of your identity, according to the chart we saw before, do you think this is? Family, right? We're talking about family. So that belongs to I don't know if I can the example. Nope. That's not what I wanted to do, of course. Let me just go back. Inherited, yes. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, mm -hmm. it's inherited. It's something that you don't choose, for example. And it's also institutional, Daniela. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree with that because, uh, you know, it, even in some constitutions and in some important government documents, uh, the basis of society, of, you know, uh, the institution as a country is the family. Right. So uh, people who have no families, mm -hmm, children who have no families are kind of outside society in a way. Yes. And that's, of course, a very sad situation. So let's go back to the text. So we were in her, a grandmother, mm -hmm, you know, um, we were talking about university students, we already had that, and we have environmental sciences as well, right? That is the uh, counterpart, we're talking about Stephen as well, yeah? So we could say that Stephen and Homan share not only the love for anime, Japanese anime, but also their institutional and temporal identity, that of being a... Uh, uh, university student, albeit a different, um, you know, kind of institution, of course. Yes, we're talking about different universities. Mm -hmm. And then families, again, boyfriends, and this is where we talk about, you know, um, you know, not only family, but also sexual identity as part of uh, the important constituents of identity. And here we go to something that perhaps is more obvious. When you talk about being a Buddhist or a Catholic. It's inherited, yes. I don't know if uh, Nicole and Camila talked about inherited as you know uh, when we when we talk when we're talking about Buddhism, um, but it could be inherited. Mm -hmm. Could could you know depending depending on the person, of course. And most importantly, Camila and Natalia, it's inspirational. Very good. Mm -hmm. So that's part of, uh, you know, when we talk about religion, Christian, Buddhist, Catholic, etc., etc., you talk about your inspirational 
identity, mm -hmm. um, which is something that we all have to a certain extent. If we were not, we are not practicing Catholics or Christians or whatever, you know, we all have something that we go by. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. So here in this text, which is, um, as far as I remember, it's a, it's a made up situation. This person doesn't exist, uh, but it's a very likely situation to happen. Yes, I think that we can all relate to this. Mm -hmm. um, now, do you see or do you know from the text where these people come from? I mean, do you know their nationalities? That's my question. We're talking about Holman and Stephen. For sure. Do we know what their nationalities are? <clears throat> no, we don't, exactly. Mm -hmm. But still, we know a lot about them, right? And we can have a sense of their identity, right, of what they are like as people. Mm -hmm. We know that they're both university students in different areas. One of them is doing English for professional communication. The other one is doing environmental sciences. They have other aspects in common, like their love of Japanese anime, right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So uh, we don't know where they are from. Mm -hmm. But that is not important in terms of, you know, who they are, yes? We can guess mm -hmm. by their names, perhaps their location, but we don't know uh, for sure, yes? We don't know whether Homan is Hong Kongese or Chinese or from Laos, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, whether she is, you know, Chinese American, for example, and she happens to be studying in Hong Kong, we don't know, right? And that's not important. So I wanted to show you this exercise and I wanted to do this exercise with you to show you and to try to help you to move away from this uh, concept of interculturality just based on uh, you know, uh, nationalities, right? This is not to say that nationalities are not important in who we are, they are, but it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. So, to sum up so far, intercultural communication challenges the link between a culture and a specific language. Mm -hmm. uh, not in the way cross-cultural uh, cross cultural studies did, right? For cross-cultural cross studies, one language, one nation, one cultural identity was, you know, something that perhaps I didn't question here. Right. Uh, what this means is that whether you have one language, whether you are a native speaker of any language, doesn't mean that you're going to fulfill the expectations uh, that people have regarding that culture. Right. OK. So, uh, for example, if you are um, a Spanish speaker, mm -hmm, um, you're not necessarily expected to have, according to this um, paradigm, you're not expected to, for example, love partying, yeah? which is something that uh, usually people think about when they interact with Latinos, for example. Intercultural communication uh, establishes a link between languages and cultural context, but based on the instance of communication, right? And this is very relevant when we talk about plurilingual or multilingual people, mm -hmm. people who have been brought up with uh, more than one language, right? Uh, we cannot say that their culture or certain aspects of their culture are linked to one of their languages, all right? Okay, it's more complex like that. So the link between the language and the cultural context and the cultural aspects is going to be seen in communication. And communication, even if you have the same people, is not going to be the same, right? Um, from one instant to, uh, instance to another. Language and cultures need to be viewed as adaptable, dynamic, and emerging resources in intercultural communication, right? Okay, so um, languages, and we're going to talk about this more in detail, uh, languages are not prefixed set of rules, mm -hmm, which is perhaps the way second language acquisition has viewed languages so far. Mm -hmm. Languages and cultures operate in a constant flow between the local and the global, particularly in reference to global languages such as English. And this is very pertinent to us English teachers, right? Mm -hmm. 
Why? Because uh, the way we were taught English and the way we are still teaching English has to do with uh, learning a language to uh, interact globally, of course, mm -hmm. but still has to do, and this is very much questionable, with the fact that we uh, teach language uh, so that people can interact with native speakers of that particular language. And in the case of English, that's not necessarily so. So we may need to abandon the ideas of a language, a culture, right? So one-to-one -on -one correspondence and think of resources and repertoires instead, right? So um, this is uh, again, relevant for people who speak more than one language, but still, you know, uh, people who speak only one or two languages can also relate to this point. Right, so now we're going to, uh, how are we doing with time? Yeah, we're doing fine, I believe. So any questions, comments so far? Nope. All right. We can leave the questions for the last part, but uh, feel free to interrupt anyway uh, for quick questions, of course. Uh -huh. So let us talk about English as a lingua franca. And this is, you know, um, very relevant to intercultural communication studies, of course. Uh, and it's also very relevant to us because we are all uh, language teachers and, uh, you know, foreign language teachers of English. Mm -hmm. So what is English as a lingua franca? What is a lingua franca? Lingua franca is a contact language, a language that uh, it's not necessarily the one that you have as a native or a mother tongue, uh, but it's a language that you use to interact with people who do not share your same linguistic resources. In that sense, Jennifer Jenkins in 2009 Jennifer Jenkins is like the mother of English as a lingua franca as uh, an area of study in um, in, in applied linguistics. She defines ELF, English as a lingua franca, as a contact language among speakers from different first languages. Now, what is important in this definition is the fact that she emphasizes that ELF, English as a lingua franca, does not exclude communication between non-native speakers of English, like us, and native speakers of English. Mm -hmm. Suggesting that native speakers of English might, must also adapt to English as a lingua franca norms. Yes, we're going to talk about some of these norms mm -hmm, in a minute. Yeah, not all of them. So uh, basically, um, th this moves away from the traditional concept of a lingua franca as a language that we use uh, to interact uh, in a third space, so to speak. Uh -huh. uh, in this sense, the, the, the third space is not um, you know, given when we have native speakers of English interacting with non-native speakers of English. Yeah. Now, another important definition of English as a lingua franca is the one given by Martin Dewey, mm -hmm. um, uh, who says that uh, English as a lingua franca or ELF is a dynamic, locally realized enactment of a global resource. Global resource, we're talking about English. Mm -hmm. Best conceptualized not as a uniform set of norms or practices, but as a highly variable creative expressions of linguistic resources, which warrants a distinct analytical framework. Yeah. So there are many things here in this definition. Mm -hmm. So we have to break it up a little bit. First of all, he defines, Martin Dewey defines ELF as a locally realized enactment of global resource, mm -hmm. which means that nowadays English, which is this, uh, you know, uh, perhaps very abstract set of rules that we know mm -hmm, uh, since uh, early days, since we start school, um, is going to be different in uh, different um, parts of the world. Uh, not only because of the national boundaries of the people who uh, interact in English, but also uh, due to their other, other aspects of their identity, like their profession, for example. Your profession pretty much influences the vocabulary that you have, for example, right? Uh, the topics that you discuss, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. 
And so this local realization of English is not going to be the same as you know, any other given local realization of English in a different part of the world with different speakers uh, with a different purpose. So in that sense, we do not have to see English anymore, or we have to try to move away from this conception at least uh, of English as a uniform set of norms and practices, right? So um, English is not a set of rules that are going to be the same or applied in the same way in different situations, right? People, especially non-native speakers of English use uh, creativity uh -huh. and uh, breaking the rules sometimes to convey their meaning, yeah? And this, and this is the last part or the last important part of this definition, this, Dewey says, is something that requires a different analytical framework. So people who do research in linguistics do not have to, for example, look at interactions between non-native speakers of English or interactions where any non-native speaker is involved as uh, something that, for example, has to be measured against uh, native speaker norms. You see, which is something that second language acquisition has done for many, many years. Second language acquisition uh, measures the performance and the competence, for example, of non-native speakers against native speakers norms. Mm -hmm. But do is that when you do research in English as a lingua franca, you do not have to use that framework. So this uh, definition or this, um, you know, plethora of research as well in English as a lingua franca has given way to a new perspective on non-native speakers. So non-native speakers now <clears throat> um, uh, are viewed as, uh, rather than following the norms, according to Barbara Seidenhofer, um, but instead of you know, following these norms as shaping the language in interaction, I'm going to show you some, some things as well later on, mm -hmm. some aspects that um, the same author, Seidhofer, uh, highlights about this. Yeah. So what, what happens usually in any, any given interaction between non-native speakers is that the speakers negotiate meaning. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes they have to change the language in order to do so. Native speakers uh, express themselves using their multilingual repertoires and not necessarily their native speaker ones, yes? Um, so um, that's also something that we have to bear in mind, especially nowadays where uh, trans languages is very much fashionable. In other words, the ownership of English mm -hmm, is questioned. Yes, and if you want to read about the ownership of English, for example, nowadays, you can read a Henry Widonso's uh, uh, paper, right, on, uh, you know, actually called the ownership of English, yeah. What this means, in other words, in very simple words, is the fact that, uh, you know, uh, native speakers, according to this elf paradigm, non-native speakers, sorry, are, um, or have the same rights to use and shape the language as native speakers, mm -hmm. which is something that goes totally against our uh, beliefs as teachers, as second language teachers, right? We still believe that, you know, and, and, and this is reinforced, for example, by international examinations, TOEFL, IELTS, uh, FCE, CPE, CAE, that, you know, success in the use of English is given by, you know, um, the fact that you have to speak like a native speaker, right? So speaking of these features that we were discussing before and this way of using the language, I have a little exercise for you here. You have two columns. The first one, the one on the left, describes the phenomenon, right? Or the phenomena, there's more than one. And the column on the right describes or gives an example of any of these phenomena. Mm -hmm. So um, what I would like you to do is start by reading the examples, the five examples on the right, and then try to find the description of the phenomenon on the left. There are more phenomena than examples. Right, and one example corresponds to only one phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So uh, remember that as well. 
again, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes and then, uh, you know, uh, we're going to share the answers as well. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm very much. I just looked at the time, and 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 there isn't much left. Uh, we still have a few slides to go, so I would like to go through the exercise with you as well, um, <clears throat> very quickly. Before we do so, I would like to point out that the examples that you see here, the ones on the right, are taken from actual real interactions and interactions of non-native speakers who are regarded as highly proficient. This is a corpus or taken from a corpus of the University of Vienna uh, of non-native speakers of English and, and the non-native speakers of English are people who um, usually work in universities, um, um, master's degrees, doctoral degrees, and who teach in English, right? Uh, because many universities now in Europe, Germany, Austria, Spain, and some other universities in Asia are conducting the programs in English so they can capture more audience. Mm -hmm. um, so the, these are people who are very much educated, so to speak, and who speak English basically on a daily basis for professional purposes. So we can say that they are proficient, yes? So these features have been observed in their discourse, in their interaction. Let us go one by one here. Number one says, the tourist office provided me with a lot of information about the city when I arrived. What do you think about this? Is there something wrong with this one? Letter F. Okay, overusing certain types of verbs high, of high semantic generality. Like, in this case, the verb would be provide. Okay, yeah, it could be, but there is another point as well. Mm, I'm afraid letter E is not the answer. Okay, Camille, I think that you are on the right track. Information, that's right, very good. So, in that sense, okay, right. I'm afraid it's not here actually. Um, I cannot see it right now. Mm -hmm. The problem, so to speak, with this uh, ex example, this use is the use of information. Uh, that's that's correct. Uncountable use of countable nouns. Uh -huh. So if you go to a dictionary or a ground book. Uh, by Oxford or Cambridge University Press, you will see that the word information is categorized as an uncountable noun. Therefore, it doesn't take an S. 
However, people are using the word information without any phrase before, like pieces of information. No, right? It's just information. And that is becoming more accepted as time goes by. So this is an example of a creative use of the language that doesn't conform to native speaker norms, at least the standard norms. Uh -huh. And that creates no problem in communication whatsoever, right? The samples that these were taken from are taken from successful instances of communication. In other words, no one in the interaction where this sentence was said pointed out that there was a mistake. You see? So they all said, you know, that they carried on with the, the, the conversation and the purpose without highlighting the problem. You see? Number two, in class, we discussed about a lot of interesting topics. What is the so-called problem here? Yes, you're all right. It's letter E. That would be the problem, right? Now, notice that the way these things or the, 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 the phenomena are described, uh, it's not negative. Overusing perhaps has a, a negative connotation, right? But letter E, in certain redundant prepositions, redundant has been um, highlighted with uh, quotation marks, right? Uh, to mean that the word redundant is questionable, yeah? So the correct form according to standard norms would be, we discuss a lot of interesting topics. The preposition about should not be there. However, Mm -hmm. If you listen to very proficient non-native speakers of English, you will see that they use this preposition after the verb discuss. Uh -huh. And again, this is becoming more accepted. Perhaps a native ear will, um, you know, highlight this as a problem. I'm not sure. In my experience, they don't. Um, they might not use it. They might say we discuss topics instead of we discuss about topics but uh, they don't highlight it as an issue. Number three, she's very healthy and swim every day after work. That's right, very good. I'm sure that you are familiar with this type of, uh, of, of uh, mistake, again, in inverted commas, quotation marks, the dropping of the third person present tense S, yes? Now, this is a feature that is very much present in um, you know, the discourse of uh, proficient speakers. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a problem, right? Uh, interlocutors still understand this as, as something that um, uh, does not create any problems, right? <clears throat> something that we don't have to stop and discuss. Number four, he's the one which I used to be attracted to when I was younger. That is correct. Very good. In, in other words, this feature has been described as an overgeneralization of the relative pronouns. Uh -huh. So instead of using the different pronouns, who, that, and which, uh, people tend to use which uh, for all of them. All right. So that's an overuse and overgeneralization. Mm -hmm. And it's also something that we correct all the time, don't we? Yes, uh, we talked about relative pronouns. We talked about uh, present tense, third person, singular, and we correct these mistakes. And we discount marks uh, when students make this kind of mistakes. And number five, my new car <coughs> is red color. That is letter H correctly, overdoing explicitness. Mm -hmm. So the word color, for example, is not necessary according to this description. It's just red mm -hmm. and red is understood as a color, right? However, this is another feature. Now, when we think about that, I'm afraid that we're not going to be able to have this uh, conversation, which is a pity because it's a very interesting one. When you think of the features that you have here, that again, as I said, they are very common. These are not taken from, um, you know, um, classroom interaction. These are taken from, you know, professional settings in a new in university, but still professional settings. So the question that remains here, and that perhaps you have to think about later, is do you think the use of such constructions like the ones we saw before shows that an elf user, and an elf user includes our students sometimes, 
has not reached a native level competence, or on the other hand, that that elf user is particularly creative with the language, extending the native English constructions. So basically, this is the debate that has been going on for many years in applied linguistics. What is a mistake that says that you don't have a native level competence? And what is a creative use of the language, right? This is a problem. <laughs> many people have not uh, uh, found the answer yet. Uh, but at least it's something that we have to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. Right. So description versus prescription. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in terms of the description, Camila and everybody here, we have, you know, we have to bear in mind and remember as well that the, um, the use of a language changes over time. So that description is not going to be permanent. Yeah, it's pretty much temporal as well. So now we're going to talk about what we hate to talk about, pragmatic strategies. Why pragmatic strategies? Um, because of this high variability of language and language use in English as a lingua franca interaction, uh, many researchers have highlighted the need to uh, um, perhaps emphasize the pragmatic strategies as opposed to language norms like the third person use, right? Now, pragmatic strategies are many. In my particular project, I, um, um, I worked with three or four, no more than that. Um, and, and, and these are strategies or moves that are usually regarded as problems in oral discourse, right? But, you know, um, in the elf corpus that I gathered, um, they are pretty much strategies or moves that enhance communication and enhance clarity. Yes. So pragmatics, basically, or uh, the, the the study of the relationship between uh, language and the users. Okay. So it's pretty much in situ. When you do pragmatic strategies, you have to study the relationship of the people and the communicative instance in each situation, yeah? So, pragmatic studies. When you have interaction in ELF, there are, you know, a certain things that you have to consider as CORE mm -hmm, in 2011 said, ELF interactions are characterized by a rich diversity in terms of varieties of English, right? Different ways of using grammar, pronunciation, etc. Speakers proficiency levels and communicative styles and also cultural norms. That's very important. And this diverse na nature can lead to understanding problems amongst speakers. So rather than looking at the forms of English mm -hmm, in ELF interaction, it is necessary to analyze the modifications and adjustments speaker make when interacting one one another. And these modifications and adjustments are the pragmatic strategies that I was referring to just a minute ago. So I have a few examples here, <clears throat> right? Some of them are taken from class interaction, some of them are not. Um, all the examples that you're going to see here are taken from conversations of uh, non-native speakers um, that have a high level of proficiency, right? Okay. As I said, some of them are part of classroom interaction, some of them are not. But, and this is something that I can contrast with my own data for my doctoral thesis, uh, the strategies do not vary. Okay, even if they're not taking from classroom interaction, in the classroom, mm -hmm, you're going to see similar strategies. Okay, so the first sample, <clears throat> there are two people, both women. One of them is Mexican, B1, B2 is Mexican, B1 is Greek, as far as I remember. And they're talking about B2's husband's surgery. He recently had an accident and he had to see uh, an operation, oral interaction, Daniela. Yeah, they are oral interaction. They were recorded, they were already recorded, and then they were transcribed. Yeah, so it's oral interaction. All the examples that you're going to see. So B2 says, yeah, I mean, he, he cannot move. Um, I think last Sunday they removed the smack slips, means that she does something like something like that, right? 
okay? Perhaps to gain time to think about the next part of her discourse. You, you know, when they sue, mm -hmm, the slash here be, uh, indicates a problem in the pronunciation, a deviation from the standard pronunciation, like this. And she makes the gesture. B1 says, yeah, mm -hmm, with rising intonation, perhaps indicating um, um, insecurity regarding the message. Yeah, ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, the teachers, yeah. Mm -hmm, that is what B1 says. So this su, this is the way it was pronounced. The pronunciation is so, as far as I remember, becomes the stitches. And then B2 does the following. She says, the stitches. Yeah, the stitches. They remove the stitches, then, but he still cannot walk. So what is happening here in this so or su, the stitches, the stitches, and the stitches? What we have here is the use of repair. In other words, other repair. Mm -hmm. B1 is correcting, very subtle, mm -hmm, a very subtle correction, is correcting what she believes is a problem in B2's discourse. So this proves that this non-standard pronunciation was understood, right? Okay, actually there was a gesture with the hand. So B1 was able to understand that they were, she was talking about los puntos de una cirugía, the stitches, right? So B, B1 in lines 419 and 420 <coughs> uh, repairs that, she performs other repair. And then what does B2 do in lines 21 and 22? What do you think she does? That is another strategy called repetition. To be more precise, this is other repetition because B2 is incorporating, thus accepting the correction uh, or the repair performed by B1. Mm -hmm. So she incorporates that and she uses it in her discourse to uh, enhance clarity and to complement idea. So repair and repetition, they are very, very important strategies in non-native communication, right? I can see, perhaps you're thinking, well, this is not pretty much different from classroom interaction, and it isn't. Uh -huh. Because when you have um, speakers or students who are able to produce discourse, you know, with uh, relative ease, um, and one of them happens to be slightly more competent and proficient than the other one, that one is likely to perform other repair, and the other one is also likely to accept that uh -huh, and uh, use repetition, yes? So repair, other repair is usually followed by repetition, repetition of that problematic item that we see. And this repetition, <coughs> which is again, or, or other repetition, is you know, uh, also very important in language acquisition and in language competence, because it is by means of repeating that we enhance, first of all, this is done through other repetition, we enhance vocabulary, and also you know, we uh, produce uh, output, mm -hmm, which is very important in language production and in language uh, and in, in oral improvement, in other words. Thank you, Daniela. I have six minutes left. I'm afraid I'm just going to be able to show you another example. This is um, an, a different uh, conversation. This is a more informal conversation. So D1 is telling others about the church money he was given as a child and how he used that money. D1 is perhaps the only person who can be described as a native speaker. He is uh, from uh, Nigeria, but he speaks other languages as well. D2 and D3 are from Asia. Mm -hmm. So they use English as a second or fourth language, right? Okay, so uh, D1 starts by saying, so my mom would give me one shilling. And the other ones, mm -hmm, at the same time, these two speakers accept this, uh -huh, mm -hmm, saying it's like an invitation to continue. And then D1, does the following, and one shilling is made up of 12 pence. Now, what we see here in this line, 168, 
is an explanation of a possibly problematic uh, item. In this case, cultural item. We're talking about a shilling. A shilling is a coin that was used in England and in uh, former colonies of, Engl of England uh, that is not used everywhere, right? So when you say that someone gives you a shilling, you have to explain that because not everybody is going to be able to understand and grasp how much money that is, you see? So it's made of 12 pence, which is not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about, uh, you know, a, a child. So he did not have a lot of money. So what this person is doing here without any indication from the other parts, the other interlocutors that there has been a problem, this person is performing preempting by explaining a difficult concept, right? Preempting is not a strategy as such. Preempting is a collection of strategies which include other repetition, repetition in general and uh, repair as well. Mm -hmm. But what preempting does, in other words, is to solve a problem that hasn't occurred yet. Okay. And that is, you know, what we meant at the beginning by being able to have this general knowledge and these, you know, um, skills to uh, be aware of certain problematic areas in intercultural communication. Right. Okay. So this shows that D1, for example, is a very competent intercultural speaker, which is what usually happens with people from Africa, because they have so many ethnicities and languages that they are you know, very much uh, good at negotiating language, right? Now, the other examples, I'm not going to stop in them, uh, show uh, examples of repetition and rephrasing as well. Repetition is not the same as rephrasing. Rephrasing is slightly different grammar and slightly different vocabulary for the same concept of idea, all right? But it fulfills the same per, uh, um, you know, um, purpose as repetition, which is to enhance clarity, yeah? To enhance the uh, clarity of the message. So these pragmatic strategies, rephrasing, repetition, and repair specifically, plus preempting, mm -hmm, which is a collection of strategies, are very important in uh, um, elf communication, mm -hmm, which is what our students are likely to encounter. Right? There are more non-native speakers than uh, native speakers. So they're very much likely to interact with non-native speakers as well. So they're very important. And yet we punish them Mm -hmm. when we are, you know, um, um, uh, evaluating or assessing, for example, or a production, if the student repeats too much, uh -huh, that is penalized and, you know, uh, frowned upon, right? So what I've tried to do here is to show you the, uh, you know, um, the way elf communication works and how these strategies, these pragmatic strategies are important for the success of any communication that happens in an intercultural context, right? I'm afraid I didn't have much time to go through the other ones. Um, I don't know, Daniela, do we have time for questions as well? Sí, sí, podemos tener algunas preguntas. Okay. So, questions. You can use the chat or... <clears throat> No problem, Antonia. I know that some of you have to go. I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Daniela. Thank you, Lisa. Great. So, Daniela, go ahead. Hi, Carmen. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the, um, the way you collected this data. Was it in... Did you ask people to send you um, recordings of conversations? How, I, I would like to know a little bit more, more yeah, about um, that. Yeah, thank you for your question. It's, it's very important the way you collect the data because that's going to determine, you know, for example, how you, uh, people speak in your, 
in your interaction. Some of the examples that you saw here are examples of outside classroom interaction, and some of them are examples of classroom interaction. The examples of classroom interaction, I usually collected myself. So I went to the classroom, uh, placed a voice recording in the, um, in the, on the table uh, where my key participants were working and recorded their conversation. And then, as I said before, I tried to uh, transcribe them and, 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 and I performed conversation analysis. But the ones that uh, happened outside classroom interaction, what I did was basically to ask my participant to take the recording with them. Uh, recording in conversations that what they were having at, during dinner, during any social meetings, and then give me their recording back. So pretty much the old fashioned way. Thank you, Carmen. No problem. But uh, if you pay attention to uh, those of you who teach, um, you know, um, more proficient learners, Mm -hmm. uh, education media, perhaps in institutes or universities, you will see that uh, uh, the same things happen when you give them an oral task, your students are going to do a lot of other repair as well, uh, and repetition. Uh -huh. So uh, what my point is here is that it's that's something that we have to uh, encourage rather than punish, which is, you know, usually what we have been doing. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in second language acquisition. So, sorry, another mm -hmm. question. Do you think that perhaps we should um, adapt our rubrics to be a bit more yeah. accepting of errors? Yes, yes that's right. Um, the rubrics that, you know, for example, we use at uh, University mm -hmm. Catholic do not specify rep repetition so much, right? There is one area that specifies repetition, but I think that we have to reconsider that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So do you think that in a monolingual context, mm -hmm. uh, the same pragmatic strategies would be used? Because these yeah. people that you use, um, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I don't have information as to whether this is something that happens in native speaker communication or not. Uh, I know that this is more perhaps evident in uh, communication amongst uh, different speakers. I mean, different uh, language speakers, but um, um, I guess that uh, there's also, you know, instances of these repair strategies or collaboration strategies as well. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. Yes, Nicole, very good. Very, thank you for your comment. Uh -huh. That's, uh, that's uh, the way in which we can do it by means of language. Mm -hmm. Uh, by, you know, uh, making our students more attuned to somebody else's needs. For example, the, 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 the example of the two women who were talking about the surgery as an example of how you can be inter interculturally competent. Camila says, would you suggest us uh, to foster pragmatic strategies within our own classrooms then to teach them students explicitly? It's very difficult, Camila. I have to say, thank you for your question because I wanted to say this and I forgot. Uh, the textbooks and the materials that we currently have do not usually pay attention. Sometimes disregard altogether pragmatic strategies. Okay, so um, if you want to do something like this, basically you have two ways to pay attention when students are doing oral tasks and also written tasks as well, but mainly oral tasks and encourage when they do something like congratulate them if they're offering, for example, a word to another person to another student. Or, you know, and this is perhaps the, the, the slowest way to produce material that encourages them to, for example, paraphrase. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this typical activity which always comes up in grammar books um, that uh, it's like the taboo word or taboo, I don't know, remember the name, right? When you give a student a word that they have to define without using that word, so they are forced to use other, other types of language. So that's a very good exercise for your students to do and uh, um, practice part of phrase. Mm -hmm. Um, then I have, I think I have another question here. Um, thank you, Pablo. Thank you for your comment. 
that spear feedback, Camila, is also very useful. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you, Daniela. Thank you very much for being here for your question. I don't know, is Sheriff, I think, had another question? Perhaps, you know, because of time, we can make the, we make it the last question. I don't know how to pronounce your name, Sheriff or Sharif. No. Okay, Daniela, te dejo, te dejo el cierre a ti, entonces. Eh, bueno, Carmen, muchas gracias por esta charla. Gracias también a todos los que, las que estuvieron presentes. Eh, de nuevo, les recuerdo que mañana vamos a seguir eh, con charlas en español y en inglés acá en nuestra facultad. Eh, lleguen al patio Humanidades y las dos se realizan al lado, una en la de letras, la otra de filosofía. Y por supuesto también eh, contarles que ahora que ya estamos un poco retomando eh, las actividades presenciales eh, normales, vamos a continuar con nuestras tradicionales escuelas de invierno y, y verano, ojalá sin, sin más interrupciones. Eh, prontamente a los que no puedan asistir mañana les comento desde ya que les va a llegar una, una pequeña, pequeña encuesta de evaluación, sobre todo para saber cuáles son sus temas de interés que les gustaría que, que ofreciéramos a futuro y para saber si, eh, que, que, cuál fue su parecer de la, de la instancia que hemos organizado en esta ocasión. Así que nuevamente muchas gracias y nos estamos viendo. Muchas gracias a todos, que disfruten el resto de las vacaciones.